không cần bình đẳng không bao gì So today's talk, uh, I have set up on vegetarianism versus veganism. To me, it's a huge difference. Uh, before we start, I'll introduce myself. Uh, I am a physician and I practice for 37 years internal medicine uh, right here in Bloomfield. And I just retired two years ago. And then my friend, Dr. Satya, I just came. Uh, he used to be volunteering here for doing counseling and all that a couple of years back. And then he gave me uh, the information. I said, well, I'm retired. Let me just come and hang out over here. And then I started loving it because, you know, practice is practice. Uh, I tried to do the best in giving, but this was very small. It seems small, but here giving was pure. There was nothing expected in return, and I started loving it. And, and wonderful people around me, the staff and all the volunteers, has made my days again and again. So I really enjoy working with them. It's a pure joy. And, and it's the path of compassion, charity, and all those things are really make sense to me. And that's the only salvation from the, from in this uh, troubled world. So uh, uh, to make it short, I will I'll, I've been vegan myself for 20 plus years, and I have a lot of experience in it for myself, of course, but a lot of my patients, uh, I told them to go vegan and they benefited quite a bit. And uh, just like uh, vegetarians, uh, Buddhism versus, we also have another sect, which has a lot of people from India are vegetarians, but they still have a lot of diseases diabetes, cholesterol. So I thought I made it a main point in the spreading the veganism for several reasons. So we'll, we'll see how we go down the slides, you know. So as I said, I am a retired physician, 37 years, and a vegan 20 years plus, and I have recommended uh, for environment benefits, uh, health benefits, and for compassion. So what is the difference between a vegetarian diet and a vegan diet? A lot of people think that vegetarian diet is good because I'm not killing animals. And uh, so it's complete. It's not complete. It's far from the truth. So I have spent a lot of years in, in investigating what really goes behind taking care of these animals. Even though you don't kill animals, the animal products themselves make you participant in the cruelty that they have to go through. So that's where I want to open up your eyes because like everybody else, I used to live in the darkness, you know, and I also grew up as vegetarian and say, okay, milk is fine, milk and cheese and butter and ice cream and butter, all those things are wonderful, so I should just keep doing it, no problem. And, but now that I have woken up, I have realized that was my dark age and now I got enlightened when it came to the veganism, you know. So that's how I suggest that let's go deep into the veganism part. Uh, I was vegan even when one of the, my patients actually gifted me this book, Diet for New America. It was written by John Robbins. He's the son of Baskin Robbins. And he is vegan. <laughs> he told his father that, uh, that I don't want multi-billion dollar empire from you. He walked away from it. Which the reason was because he had access to all the factories where the animals are kept, which was the source for the milk from which the, the milk products were made by Baskin and Robbins. And uh, I came across a lot of research that he had done. So I always believed in veganism, but then my patient himself had MS and he had a neurological disease and all his life he was in a pesticide business. So unfortunately, the chemicals in the pesticides got to him, and then he also became vegan, because in the book, there are a lot of scientific studies published, and uh, there is a con deep connection between the animal products, <clears throat> especially the milk, and eggs and cheese and all that, and meat itself, of course, 
connection with so many human diseases that we all are suffering right now. So at this point, compassion I've already had, but compassion, compassion met the science. Then my belief in the uh, vegan food started expanding. So uh, total diseases that we all face with includes high cholesterol, diabetes, coronary artery disease, obesity, many cancers, high blood pressure, neurological diseases like even Parkinson's. He found that there are links between the animal foods and Parkinson's disease and MS, of course, multiple sclerosis, and psychological disorders, which we don't even understand, but there is a connection between anxiety, stress, depression, grief, all these things are connected with the animal source of foods, which we will talk about it later. All these things that we are talking about, we can prevent with the help of, you will say, what is WFPD? Whole food plant-based diet. So vegan diet alone is not enough. The next step to that is a healthy vegan diet is whole food plant-based diet. So let's see where we go with that. So if you really ask yourselves, why are we saying that? What is so wrong uh, with animal foods? So my first question would be, we are going to break it down into separate sections. So first question is, what is cholesterol? If I ask everybody, they say, oh yeah, we know cholesterol. Cholesterol gives you heart attack and stroke and whatever. We all know that. But if I ask these questions to 100 people, 98% would give a wrong answer, including doctors. I have tried that to doctors also. And, and they say, oh yeah, yeah, we get, we get a plaque in the arteries and we get a heart attack. And yeah, yeah, no, we know that. That's a universal knowledge. It's not a big deal. But what is cholesterol? Why do we have cholesterol in our body? Nobody knows. I must have asked about 100 people in my practice. Two kids, give me the right answers because they were in a biochemistry class. <laughs> so <laughs> this answer can shock you. What is cholesterol? Dr. Google gave me the answers. Even I didn't know before I asked Dr. Google because the biochemistry was just an option. You just get rid of it because your focus is on becoming a doctor. So cholesterol is an organic molecule and it is a lipid. It is a fat. And it, is, it makes every single animal cell membrane, the cell wall, is made out of cholesterol. So that means every single part of our body is made out of cholesterol. We are cholesterol. That means all animals are also cholesterol. So cholesterol is extremely vital for our body. And that's why nature has given us a capacity to make our own cholesterol because cholesterol makes new cells. And the life is all about making new cells, getting rid of the old cells, that's how we get, get older. And when we lose the capacity to make new cells from the cholesterol, we die. It's the process ends. So that means cholesterol is extremely important for us. So when we make enough cholesterol, then why do we need extra cholesterol? Extra cholesterol is what gives us the problems. So that means if you eat animals or animal products, they all will have cholesterol. So my next job was to ask Dr. Google again. And I was so surprised. And you can do the same thing at home. Google anything that comes from animals will always have cholesterol. Whether you eat chicken thighs or chicken breast or chicken feet or you eat snakes or goats or Camels, doesn't matter. You draw their blood, all animals will have cholesterol. Mm -hmm. So this is a very strong eye-opener for me. Mm -hmm. I suddenly realized that now I have something great in my hands that as a doctor I can tell them that you have high cholesterol, what do you do about it? Don't eat. <laughs> Simple as that, right? So that means we cannot avoid cholesterol if you eat animal foods. But at the same time, we'll see what comes to that. So what does it mean? Every time you drink milk, eat cheese, butter, yogurt, 
ghee, which is clarified butter from India, you were eating cholesterol. Chicken, fish, people think chicken and fish are okay. I mean, not that here, but in general, it's a, meat is not the only thing that's high in cholesterol. Chicken and fish are also high in cholesterol. So even that's a fallacy on people's minds. So by doing this, we are adding cholesterol, which our body is already making it. So we have overlap, overload of cholesterol in our body. And it's not a surprise that we all end up with high blood pressure, cholesterol, heart attacks, strokes, all those things are natural results. So this causes many diseases. So let's start with milk first. Again, what is milk? Milk is made by a cow for her calf, correct? Mm -hmm. And who makes the milk in the world? Mothers. So cow is a mother. And the entitlement for that milk goes to the calf, right? Mm -hmm. Why are we drinking milk? We are not babies. We are not babies of the cow. We gave up our own mother's milk at the age of what, six months, a year? Then we stopped drinking our mother's milk. And then we picked up someone else's mother's milk for the rest of the life. Does that make sense? It's just physiologically not normal to drink milk. Milk is a bond between mother and a child. And we're snatching it away. In the name of industrialization, corporatization, politicizations, politicizations, all those things we keep on consuming, we never think. We're still living in a dark age. Our men, we have a mental fog that it's okay. Because you see commercials, you're going on a park where suddenly says, got milk, got milk, got milk, mustache, milk, and all those things. With the propaganda, they keep on increasing your belief, making it dense that milk is necessary for you. How is it necessary? In, in the universe, every mother makes the milk for their own child. If you go in the nature, the dog's babies don't drink cow's milk or cat's milk. Everybody sticks to their own mothers until they become self-sufficient and they start, they give up the milk and they start regular diet, but these are stuck. So there is something wrong with that. Is this normal? Ask ourselves. It's not normal. Why are we doing this? So there are a lot of big misconceptions about milk. That's what we just said. On top of that, milk is high in cholesterol. Why? Because it's an animal product. It is high in sugar, which I'll explain to you later. Full of fat. Cholesterol is what? It's fat. Cholesterol is a fat, just we say it's a fat molecule that makes the cell wall. So when you consume milk, that is going to be fat. So to make you convenient for this, oh, we'll, we'll remove the milk, uh, there is fat from the milk, and we'll give you non-fat milk. As long as you keep on consuming it, they have no problem. And they can charge you more by removing as if they're doing us a favor. So when the fat is removed, cholesterol is gone, but there are other problems. Three is animal protein, which has its own problems, which we'll deal with later. It's also loaded with hormones and antibiotics. As a part of animal industry, they have to inject hormones. And the hormones are injected to the cows for what? To increase the milk production. And all these hormones, where do they go? They come in our body. And that has created a lot of issues that nobody wants to talk about. Especially the big corporations definitely don't want to hear about it. But it is there, it is a fact, which we will deal with in a minute. And then there are antibiotics because the, those days are gone when the cows were roaming free on, in the farms and away from each other. Now, in, in a small room, there are five, six cows, all close to each other. So what do they do? They're easy to transmit infections from one cow to the other. So they load them up with antibiotics. So what happens to those antibiotics? They are given the antibiotics, same antibiotics that are given to humans. So their body has bacteria which are resistant to the antibiotics already. 
And when we consume these dairy products, the bacteria, because milk is loaded with bacteria, believe it or not, they come into our body, gives us the infections, and we go to the doctors and he gives the antibiotics and they don't work. Because these bacteria already know those antibiotics. So they are resistant. So this antibiotic resistance is a big thing. Now they are trying to bring the, the, uh, the law that the same antibiotics which are used for humans should not be used for. But again, these are all corporations and government, they, hand, they wash each other's hands. And it takes a long, long thing before you realize. But meanwhile, we become part of the statistics. So if you have developed antibiotics and you the antibiotics, I mean, develop a pneumonia and you get the antibiotics and don't work, we die. We are part of the history. While the fights keep on going between the corporations and people and all those things. So the awareness has to come from us. So cholesterol, like we say, one cup of cholesterol, 24 milligrams of I mean, one a cup of milk gives you 24 milligrams of cholesterol. No, no, this is not it. Cheese, one cup of cheese, 256 milligrams of cholesterol. It's 10 cups of milk makes one cup of cheese. <coughs> cheese, since the cheese was invented, the diseases have skyrocketed. And a lot of coronary artery blockages and all those things are happening all over the world. Thanks to the cheese. One cup of yogurt also gives you 24 milligrams of cholesterol. Eggs. I have some people who love eggs. <laughs> they are here. <laughs> One egg, 187 milligrams of cholesterol. Where are you going to go with that cholesterol? You don't need it. What are you going to do, right? Fish oil. It's been touted as saving your heart from a heart disease wrong one teaspoonful of fish oil 104 milligrams of cholesterol wow. so it's loaded in the name of preventing your heart disease they're giving you a heart attack but all the plants have zero cholesterol you google it anything plant-based you name it cashews almonds walnuts you pick up anything from the plant side and you check for their cholesterol content zero why? Because their cell walls on the plant side are made out of cellulose. Cellulose is fiber. Fiber is a beautiful thing because fiber is rough. When you eat, it rubs against your inner lining of your intestines, which are very soft and delicate, but the fiber in your food scrubs it out and all the dying cells which are in the front are taken away into your stool. Get rid of it. So in one hand, in one way, it actually reduces your cholesterol, 15%. So if you look at the Quaker Oats commercial, they say we reduce cholesterol. That's how they do it. So one thing, by getting rid of the dying cells, they capture those cells, work like a sponge, hold on to these cells. When you move your bowels, they take it out. That's how they reduce your cholesterol. But that's not where the advantage ends. What they also do is, they kill, they take the old cells, dying cells away, that brings the healthy cells in front. Now, when we eat food, it has tons of chemicals and toxic chemicals, pollutants, everything is there, whether we want it or not, it's there. So, they, when they come in contact with our inner linings, if there are dying cells, which have lost the capacity to fight these chemicals that exposes them to cancer, but healthy cells which have come in the front has more capacity to fight against the cancers. So animal foods have been linked with cancers, and this is the reason, because animal food has zero fiber. Remember, animals made out of cholesterol, plants made out of fiber, if you switch to the animal sites, they have zero fiber. They have no fiber at all. So they have no protection against the cancers. So red meat especially has been linked with colon cancer. And this is the reason. And that's why they tell you don't eat red meat. But that's only one of the side effects. But there are so many other side effects with the animal foods and other sites of cancers also. So eating the plant-based diet 
It reduces your cholesterol, but it also protects you against intestinal cancers. So it's a wonderful thing. Nobody talks about it. Why? Why nobody talks about it? There is no money. Simple as that. Corporate world is all about revolves around money. So a chemotherapy injections may be costing fifteen thousand dollars. That appeals to them. Or they say, let's let's cure cancer. Let's cure cancers. Nobody says prevent cancer. That's where we come into, and that's where I want my intention and our organization work. We want to make people aware, along with a lot of other benefits, prevention of cancer and heart disease, all those things. So milk, as I said earlier, there is also a link with diabetes. 40% of the calories of the milk is made by lactose. And lactose is sugar. That's why it has that sweet taste to it. So lactose goes in our body and goes in and turns into two molecules, glucose, which is sugar, and galactose, which is a special protein that gets stored in the liver. But at the drop of a hat, it can convert into sugar right away. So 40% of the calories of the milk is made out of sugar. And people say, oh, it's okay, there is no problem. Milk gives you diabetes. So hormones is a big thing. Uh, I know we briefly talked about it, but it's really horrifying to realize how these cows are capped. I did a research in the Harvard Magazine. They documented that out of 365 days, 300 days, they force the cows to give milk. And that's why, in general public's impression, oh, cow always gives milk, right? It's not true. Cow is a female just like anybody else. Do all females give milk all the time? No. Then what is the difference between women and cows? Women are not industrialized, thank God, but the cows are. I read in the Discover magazine, so they did a lot of anthropological studies and they found out that the bush women, they used to have 140 menstrual cycles per year. I mean, in, in, uh, in their lifetime. 140 menstrual cycles in their lifetime. So if you say once a month, say 12 per year, would be about 12 years that would be their peak menstruating phase where they can get pregnant. Only 140 menstrual cycles in their lifetime. Now, modern women have 400 menstrual cycles. And this is average. The menarche, which is where the menstrual period starts, when I was in India, it used to be 14, 15. And here, eight, nine-year-old girls are getting menstrual periods. Nine-year-old girls getting pregnant have been documented. The periods start earlier. Why? Why so much difference? the estrogen, which is being injected to the cows and ultimately comes in our body. So we, have, we are really playing with God's molecules, which were created by the nature to give you natural cycles of productivity and passing on your genes and chromosomes to the next species and all that. Now we are handling all those things as if we know everything about it. And that's what's creating a lot of problems. There is estrogen everywhere. Not just the milk, even in cosmetics. They're loaded with estrogen. Why? Because everybody wants to make their skin supple. They want to look young. All those things are big consequences. We get a lot of estrogen. So estrogen is only one of the hormones. The other hormones, which are naturally present in the milk. It's, there are nine hormones. See, it's different. Whether you eat, pluck an apple from a tree and you eat it, it's not the same as you drink milk from mother, a cow. Because the milk is a connection between mother and a child. So naturally it's supposed to have hormones for the baby to grow. So there are nine hormones naturally present in the milk. When it goes into the calf, it makes the calf grow. And one of the hormones is called IGF-1. It's called 
insulin like growth factor that's the name and it's natural hormone it's not even injected now the job of igf1 is to go into the calf's body and stimulate the, the sex centers and it is a neutral hormone whichever wherever it ends up it will stimulate for example if it goes into the male calf it will keep on stimulating and then help him become a bull and if it goes to into female calf it will stimulate their female sex centers to make them a cow so igf1 helps them grow but what what about us we are fully grown our sex centers are already stimulated so what happens when the milk comes in our body our sex centers get overstimulated and overstimulation of anything leads to cancer so milk has been linked with breast cancers cervical cancers uterine cancers and in men prostate cancer so all these things are connected with milk and yet we think that oh i like the cheese ice cream all those things right so high level of hormones and also they are injected with growth hormones this is a, it's a it's a genetically engineered growth hormones are injected to the cows and they are given very heavy feed with too much nutrition between the nutrition and injection of the cow uh, the hormones the cows keep on lactating 300 out of 365 years they never have a break the worst part is they are giving milk because once they are made pregnant it takes 9 months of pregnancy but 9 months is a waste of time so they induce lactation while the cow is pregnant now look at the atrocities which are being conducted now in a humans it doesn't happen because we are not abused like the cows so they one hand they are pregnant and they still have to keep on giving the milk because the milk production cannot go down so we think that oh cows always give milk it that is a lot of atrocities behind all these things so one of the biggest study on nutrition was done by dr campbell and it was called the china study very pertaining to you because it comes from china he did it a very very beautiful scenario china had was that in the remote parts of china they had a very authentic cuisine which was very healthy which they had been consuming for thousands and thousands of years and also they had shanghai beijing and all those cosmopolitan cities which were very westernized and they realized that there is a huge difference between the two population is one of the largest studies done one of the finding they had was only one out of 38 women were getting breast cancer in the remote china and in shanghai and beijing one out of seven women even in this country the the book diet for new america john robbins that book came out in 1980 right at that time he had predicted there is going to be a major epidemic of breast cancer in this country at that time used to be one out of 10 women getting breast cancer now one out of seven in this country now imagine we are 300 million population in us 50% being female 150 million women is a huge deal instead of one out of 10 women one out of seven women getting breast cancer and it's not just the breast cancer these hormones also make the fibroids like the uterine cancers and all those things leads to obesity all these issues are there with the milk so we really need to raise our awareness is milk good for us or not it's not <laughs> so we have a lot of alternatives plant based proteins are available plant based milks are available almond milk plant based other milk cashew milk oat milk there are a lot of choices available we are addicted to milk because that's how we grew up but addiction is a repeated phenomenon that keeps on going in your mind but we have to realize that we did not we were not actually born with that instinct but we were given when we were a child in fact the lactose which is part of the milk 
to digest, you need lactase enzyme, right? We are not born with it. We are not born with it. It is an induced phenomenon because when we keep on getting milk, our body learns how to make lactase enzyme. And that's how we start digesting the milk. Now, I haven't had dairy product for 20 plus years. Now, if I try, and I tried it, a couple of candies, I started getting stomachache. Why? Because my body has lost the lactase enzyme. That means physiologically, I'm more close to nature, which is the way I was supposed to be born, than the people who are consuming. And now, my wife likes <laughs> apple get ice cream, see? <laughs> so right there in Montclair. And I, I am above just the vegetarianism. Or, so I don't force anything on anyone because freedom is above everything. So I tell her whatever. So at some time ago, I used to go and pick up apple get ice cream for her. And if I'm in that area, and I'll bring it and she'll enjoy and all that. Now I can't stand there because the, the smell is just kicking me out. I cannot even smell the milk, let alone consuming it. It's a different story. I'm just giving an anecdote to realize how body can change, but with a single determination that this is not right. You might start a journey with that cholesterol, and there are a lot of other things which will come across how my belief in veganism became more and more dense. So when I speak, I'm speaking 20 years of my hard work of my life. And it's not a hard work, it's a joy, which I'll also show you later on. So plant-based yogurts are available. There are a lot of no dearth of proteins because the first thing people ask is, what do I do with about protein? One glass of milk gives you eight grams of protein. There are eight grams of protein is very easy to get. It's not a big deal. Lentils, quinoa, chia seeds, peas, soy, tofu. These are all very high in protein. Pumpkin seeds, peanut butter, all those things are alternatives are available as long as you are ready to make a change and put them in a different uh, stages of your day-to-day -day life, it is very easy to collect enough protein. So it's not that you have to drink milk for protein. And same thing, non-dairy calcium sources. There is everybody asks, so what about the calcium? Now calcium is very interesting, you have to understand. Say one glass of milk has 200 and, sorry, 305 milligrams of calcium. It's good, it has a lot of calcium, no question about it. But what happens is, it's also high in animal protein. So what animal protein does, it, it binds with the calcium and takes it out. So only 30% of the total calcium That's okay. So only 30% of calcium is available to your body. This is called bioavailability. How much actually goes in your body? Right? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, out of 305, 150 milligram almost gets lost in your stool. 50%, I mean 70%, so almost 210. You hardly get 90 milligrams of calcium, right? 30%. But plant-based proteins do not interact with calcium. So if you eat the plant-based protein, say one cup of, say, kidney beans, right? It will have 295 milligrams of calcium, but only 50% goes in your stool. But the other 50% goes in your body. So which one is the winner? The plant-based protein. You actually get almost 150 milligrams of calcium versus 30, uh, 90 milligrams from milk. So these are all possible. So scenarios that are it's been fed into our mind that you need milk for calcium and protein is not true. And also they have a situation about the vitamin D. People think that, oh, the milk is high in vitamin D. Not true. Vitamin D is never part of the milk. It's fortified. Why is it fortified? To put you in your head that, oh, it's high in calcium. It's high in vitamin D. So it makes your bones strong. Totally wrong. Vitamin D has been added to the milk. The same way you can add it to other milks, plant-based milk, almond milk, soy milk, they all come with vitamin D fortification. So it's not a problem. Of course, spending, spending time in the outdoor also generates vitamin D. And there are a lot of other sources of vitamin D also, like uh, walnuts, flax seeds, hemp seeds, 
certain the plant based Brussels sprouts they're all high in vitamin D3. So certain shiitake mushrooms are high in vitamin D3. Almonds are high in vitamin D3. So there are plenty of sources and the supplements are always available. The same supplements they're putting in the cow's milk. So it's not just for vitamin D, you don't have to drink the milk. B12 is another major issue that a lot of people have. Now, B12 is very tricky. Now, I used to be vegan and my B12 level also came back low. And I said, well, if I believe in vegan food so much, why is it not complete? What about B12? Why? And the real source of B12 is basically animals, food, meat, uh, milk, and all those things. But I said, I don't want to do it. Then I did more research and I found out how do the cows make the B12? And why can't we make the B12? The source is very interesting because they are given the feed. The feed comes from the farms. Now, their feed is not sterilized like our food is irradiated, all those things and cleaned and washed out and everything. We destroy all the bacteria in it so that we don't get sick kind of sensations. So we don't get those bacteria, but those bacteria are present on the feed that is given to the cows. So these bacteria actually go in their intestines and make the B12. So bacteria make the B12, it does not belong to the cows. If we lived in a jungle, for example, and drank the water from the stream, or picked up a fruit from a, a tree, we'll be making our own B12. It's not a big deal. But it's not practical to go and live in a jungle. So we live here and what do we do? Take the supplement. That's it, simple as that. That's the easiest way to take it. So B12, vitamin D, calcium, protein, these are all fallacies that we center around the dairy and it does not have to be. So in fact, switching that you will end up eating lots of fruits and vegetables and they have been known to reduce the cancer, heart disease, respiratory illnesses and all that. Animal foods, like we said, has been linked with cancer. There is one eye-opening chemical that I want to talk about. It's called diethylstilbestrol. This chemical was routinely injected to the cows until the study was done to find out that it causes cancer. So they banned it. So now nobody can use diethylstilbestrol to be given to the cows because they found out that it goes into the milk, milk goes into the humans and it causes breast cancer. So that's been banned. But America is very smart. Corporates are very smart. So all they have to do is Treat the molecule instead of diethylstilbestrol. Now they have triethylstilbestrol, and the study that was done on diethylstilbestrol, it takes so many years to link a chemical with a cancer. It's not that overnight simple that, oh, oh, this causes that. It needs a lot of study. So, all right, so now you do a study on triethyl. Until the study comes out, we cannot keep selling it. So, there are routinely estrogen like substances are being injected in the cows. Not estrogen, not diethylstilbestrol, but so many other chemicals which have estrogen-like properties. And unfortunately, we are paying the big price for it. And the same thing, like I said, there is 11% rise of prostate cancer if men consume the dairy products. And this is regular prostate cancer, we are not talking about. But eggs, eating two and a half eggs a week increases chances of lethal prostate cancer in men 85%, almost 80%. 80% rise in a risk of lethal prostate cancer if men consumes more than two and a half eggs a week. And of course, being the cholesterol, the fat leads to obesity. And obesity has been linked with so many cancers, not just the uh, regular colon and breast cancers, but esophageal cancer, thyroid, a lot of even uh, blood malignancies like multiple myeloma and all those things, you know. So we really need to be, if you do really go on a whole food plant-based diet, you will become thin. And your BMI will go down and all the risks of other cancers also will go down. 
So vegetables, fruit consumption prevents the breast cancer. And if these are all studies are actually done, scientific studies have proven that it reduces the whole food plant-based diet, reduces lung cancer, colon cancer. So, so we want to not just live long, we want to live a healthy life. That's the ultimate goal. So environment, <coughs> I know Zuchi is, is uh, environment is another arm that Zuchi is really. Uh, so I'm going to tell you an interesting story about it. How I found the connection between veganism and environment. <coughs> Excuse me. In eighth grade, my son was in eighth grade biology textbook. I was doing homework with him, right? And suddenly I came across something called Rule of Ten. Rule of Ten is a science, scientist proven rule that is across the whole globe. What does it mean, Rule of Ten? Rule of Ten means whenever one organism wants to consume the other organism, the exchange can happen only 10%. For example, a chicken wants to eat wheat. Now, it cannot eat the roots, it cannot eat the stalk, it cannot eat the leaves, it cannot eat the flowers, it can only eat the wheat, the grains. So the plant holds on to 90% of the, its own calories and uses for itself. It only shares 10%. Now, this was not just a coincidence. They did a large study. They found out any time, any organism crosses, the only thing that is exchanged is 10%. So I was shocked. And it really had a lot of implications, and I'll show you how. This simple diagram, it looks simple, but it's telling you the profound fact. And was made by my friend Avinash. <laughs> so that's the scenario I gave, is that if a chicken wants to eat wheat, it gets only 10% calories from one stock, right? So, uh, no, I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. Thanks. So that means it cannot survive on one plant because it's only getting 10%. So it will have to survive on 10 plants. So one chicken has to, this is hypothetical scenario, has to survive on 10 plants. So the land which is occupied by 10 plants would be enough to sustain a chicken. But you go on a higher food chain. Say a fox wants to eat chicken. Same problem. Chicken hooves are no good, chicken feathers are no good, chicken beaks are no good, chicken bones are no good. The meat that comes out is only 10%. Again, scientifically proven. So that means one fox needs 10 chickens to survive. But each chicken needs 10 plants. So how many plants one fox needs? 100. Because it needs 10 chickens. Indirectly, it has to survive because who makes the food first? The vegetables, the plants. Plants make the food first, and then we consume, and then we go on higher and higher food chains, right? So one fox has to survive on, it needs 100 plants of wheat. And same thing goes for lion. If a lion wants to eat a fox, same problem. 10 foxes, 1,000 uh, chickens, uh, 100 chickens, and 1,000 plants of wheat are needed for one lion to survive. That's why lions have big territories. That's why they need big territories to survive because they are highest on a food chain. So that's, what does that mean? That means, and this was in the book. At that time, there was no concept of veganism. So the book said that if everybody, the whole world became vegetarian, that's what they say, then only 10% of the land will be necessary because chicken is vegetarian. So it needs only 10 plants. Fox is not vegetarian, it's carnivorous. It needs 10 times the land to survive. And lion, of course, 1,000 times. So that means that 90% of the farms are growing food for the animals, not for us. It's a sad state that we can theoretically survive. The whole population, human population, can survive on 10% of the farmland which exists right now. What will happen to the other 90%? Jungles will grow on it. Lots of trees will grow on it. Lots of biodiversity, lot of animals will be supported in it. 
And what will happen to the environment? All the greenhouse gases will be gone because leaves sequester carbon because it's food for the leaves. So the plants, the trees will absorb all the carbon dioxide and the greenhouse gases will be gone. Global warming will be gone. So this is how powerful this rule of 10 is. And the proof is right there. Actually, the, our national symbol, bird, national bird is the bald eagle. At one time, the bald eagle war, it was gonna become extinct in this country. And what killed it, was killing was DDT. So the DDT was a pesticide which was being spread on the, on the crops. And when that would have a runoff, it would go into the water streams, the small streams, the bigger streams to end up in the ocean. Then the fish will consume, small fish will consume, the bigger fish will consume, the smaller. Keeps on going on a food chain. <clears throat> and who is on the highest food chain? The bald eagle. He's the highest predator. All the DDT was being accumulated in the eggshells of the bald eagles. And the eggshells were becoming soft and break down. So the babies, before they had a chance to hatch, the eggs would break. And they were losing babies right and left. And that's why the bald eagles were becoming extinct. So DDT was banned. And now we see the results, bald eagles are bouncing back. In fact, now we have more bald eagles than even when the pilgrims came into this country. So what a success story, but a lot to learn from it. Now, what are we doing? If we consume animal products, we are at the fox level. So now imagine if the, there are chemicals, chemicals we cannot avoid. There are chemicals in the plants. So 10 plants worth of chemicals goes into chicken's body, but 100 plants worth of chemicals goes into fox and 1,000 into the lion. So the higher you go on a food chain, more chemicals can in our body. So that means we, if we are at the fox level, eating meat, dairy, meat, dairy products and all that, we're going to have 10 times more chance of developing cancers. Chemicals cause the cancer, it's obvious. So that's why we need to stay to the ground. Now say that the vegan is, the name is coined, so still go for veganism, not even vegetarianism as the book says, right? So it's beautiful concept that how we realize that these are the real live examples that tells in us that stay vegan. Because like I said, the chemicals cause cancer, but remember, the source where the chemicals are coming from, that's what matters. Whether they're coming from animal foods, if you are eating chickens, so animal food, or whole food plant-based diet, which is full of fiber. The chemicals, come from animals would be fat soluble. Why? Because animals are made out of cholesterol. Cholesterol is fat. So all the chemicals present in the animal's body will be dissolved in their fat. So they will have fat soluble chemicals. And plants are made out of water. The only plants on the nuts and all that are in oil, fat, but most of the other fruits, vegetables, they're all water-based. So water-based chemicals, even if they come in our body, it pass because we are not camels. We cannot hold on to the water. So we drink and it's got to go, it goes. So there is a continuous turnover, less chances of cancer. But if we consume animal products, it is giving us fat-soluble chemicals. They come in our body and dissolve in our fat because we are also animal and they are released slowly over the period of years and years and years. That's what causes cancer. So I'll just show you a couple of results of my patients where they really made a huge difference. There's one lady, this lady, her total cholesterol was 250, her back cholesterol was 179. She went on eight weeks of a vegan diet Look at the LDL. This is the sticky cholesterol that clogs your arteries from 179 to 98 in eight weeks because she stopped all the animal products completely. 
This lady uh, also, same thing happened. 113 became 78. Actually, I have a story to tell about this girl. <laughs> so she had, uh, she came to see me from upstate New York. She drove about three and a half hours to come see me. I said, why did she do that? Is that it's not what? He says, no, but my mother tells you that you're a good doctor and she lives right in Montclair. She's, she was not even my patient, but she has heard that you're good, so I came to see you. I said, okay. So she had some asthmatic bronchitis. She said, can you take care of it? I said, yeah, no problem. And then when we finished everything and she tells me that, doc, my cholesterol is very high. What do I do about it? And she was strong headed. I said, what did your doctor say? He says, she said, yeah, she told me, you have to take statins, you have to take medicine because her bad cholesterol was like 179. And he says, I said, yeah, the numbers are pretty bad. She got to do something. He says, I said, did you get a second opinion? He says, yeah, I went to an endocrinologist. And I said, what did he say? He said, same thing. And he says, I just came back from Italy tour because her ex was Italian. And you know that everybody eats in Italy, so she had everything. So her cholesterol was so high. So she asked me, Doc, what do you think? I said, well, you came to a different doctor. So I'm going to ask you a question. She says, yes, sure, the question. He says, I, I say, if you try to catch something, it runs away, what would you do? What would you do? If you try to catch something, it runs away, what would you do? Try to catch. What's that? Try to catch. Try to catch. 99% of the people say that. She didn't say that. She had heard that I was vegan. She put the two things together and she said, I will let it go. If I try to catch something, something is running away. Why is it running away? To save its own life. I am forcing myself onto the animals. They have legs to save their own lives. Plants don't run away. Trees don't run away. Believe it or not, overnight she became vegan. She decided. She said, I want to do it. I don't want to take a pill. And you see the results. Amazing. She actually texted me personally. She said she had some cholesterol done in supermarket. And she said, thank God for your wisdom. <laughs> Dr. Shah, yes. I take a few seconds only. Yeah. Uh, my wife and uh, we went to Dr. Shah. He was not our doctor at that time. We just go first time. And we find out my wife complained I have cholesterol in her, the same kind of report and doctor says very honestly to my wife you want to take a pills for a whole life or you want to try something different <laughs> and this is a true story yeah. we don't know him and I don't personality him okay. <laughs> so she said okay I try and he suggests to go uh, non-dairy products he don't say he says vegan, but we don't have much clue about vegan. Uh, five, five but her numbers dropped quite a bit. And it was very, like a, yeah. And I have so many examples like that. One, uh, right. With her. Same thing, another patient, the cholesterol dropped 150 to 116, but look at the A1C, which is the diabetic marker, 7.1, it should be 5.7. She dropped from 7.1 to 5.4. Wow. That's on a vegan diet. So a lot of examples are there. Now I'm coming to the last lag after discussing the health and environment, the compassion, where the Zuchi stands for it. And the Buddha gave us thousands and thousands of years back. See, compassion is something that is necessity. It has become so necessity in this world where there's so much violence and uh, disregard for each other's life is going on. Compassion plays a major role. And veganism is a way of offering your compassion towards the animals because they also have emotions, they also have sensations. So your food choices can not only change you, but it can change the world also. So compassion is, is a unique quality that is hidden in all of us, but we just have to bring it out. And it's not that you can practice compassion. You really cannot, because when you practice compassion, you're doing at the mind level. No, compassion is not at the mind level. It's at the heart level. And I'll tell you a story for that too. Uh -huh. 
So this is the state of the cows nowadays. You know, all those cartons that you see where the cows are roaming and it, it's all makeup. It's not the, this is the actual reality, how the cows are kept. This is their sad story. Every day they are hooked up for milking. 300 out of 365 days. And like I said, we are stealing the milk from the cow. They say that every glass of milk you are drinking, the calf is not. Artificial insemination. This is where I'm going to tell you the story. I, everybody knows, I, well, some people know I'm into meditation and spirituality. And it also came pretty much at the same time along with the veganism. I just bumped into it and I got so deep into it and I've been meditating and everything. And one of these days, and, and a lot of things spring up from within when you meditate. It's beautiful because in meditation you connect with the formless consciousness. And the forms differ from each other. That is we call duality. You are different than me physically. At body level we are different. So at mind level we are very different and we see the results of it. So the life which is lived at the mind and the body level will always have frictions. But when you go beyond the mind, there is a flow. There is a life that's flowing within. You actually palpate it. You feel it. And that's where we are all the same. We are all the same because it's formless. It does not, does not have a shape or size or color or nothing. Everybody's soul is the same. So I give you background because one day I was meditating and I was very deep in it. And I had a recent discussion with my son about because he's very democratic, very free, just how the kids should be. He's very, he's a lung specialist and he's really very, very ethical person. And we just had some discussion and somewhere along the line, I ended up meditating that evening. And as I kept going deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper, and then it just hit the bottom rock and you just experienced the consciousness. And suddenly a message came from within that artificial insemination is a rape. Artificial insemination is routinely done to the cows. And suddenly hit me, who asks the cows whether they want to be pregnant or not? Nobody. Pregnancy is a big thing. Nine months of suffering. Imagine the same practice being done in human society. What do we call so I just felt for the cows so much that every single product seemed a product of rape to me. I cried. I cried like crazy. And that day I became spiritual vegan. Up until then, I was at the body level. I said, yeah, 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 your cholesterol is bad. You need to lose weight. It will help you lose weight, this and that. At the mind level, yeah, the environment, this does that. If you can understand this, you should not do that because it will help the environment. But those are the interplays of the mind and the body. I used to go to the parties and everybody will be consuming ice cream and this and that. And I will not. And I will feel kind of left out. And I will leave the party and say, but then when I go home, I said, okay, I'm glad I didn't, you know. But that split mind, mind always has two sides. Either it makes you go this way and also this way. So you're wasting your energy. But only when you connect with the soul, there are no two ways. It's only one. The one you connect. And when I connected with that and suddenly I woke up, that don't consume dairy products. Now, whenever I go to the parties and don't consume dairy products, there is a joy. And in that joy, everything, the mind has to listen to the soul, the body has to listen to the soul. And in that joy, Connection with the world starts. I started connecting with the cows that I have not even seen. That's compassion that arises. So go deep and let it arise. And that's when you will see what compassion is. But it's beautiful. It's beautiful and it does. Since then I became vegan and I converted a lot of, a lot of people 
came to veganism, I became a president of a world vegan society. Now I'm a medical director, I have given lectures. A lot of things have happened and it just keeps raining more and more and more. So that joy comes in to realize that this is a, unfortunately a, a, a tool they use to number the cow. Look how much torture. This morning I was cutting oranges and <laughs> I cut my finger. It hurts. If it hurts you, what do you think? The cows are not hurt? Imagine this. Buddha said, feel the pain, feel the suffering of the fish. Look at the fish. What is happening to the fish? So this is, the, it has to come within us. This is the picture of a calf. Now you imagine there is a male calf and a female calf. Female calf is going to become a cow. Correct? But what's gonna, what happens to the male calf? Slaughterhouse. And male calf meat is veal. Veal is highly prized because it's very tender, very delicate. And this is not where the cruelty ends because all of them are slaughtered. But it's not that a male calf is born and suddenly the restaurant calls. So they wait for the restaurant's order to come so they can serve the fresh meat. The male calves are kept in wooden crates where they cannot escape, they cannot move. Why not moving? Because when you move, this blood circulation increases and you start growing. They don't want them to grow. Also, these wooden crates don't have iron nails because if they leak iron, that will turn into hemoglobin, which is our, uh, and it stimulates the blood. So the quality of the meat deteriorates. This is how cruel it is. And this is where the calf is being taken to the slaughterhouse and the mother is running after it. Is it worth it? Why? Why consume something that is backed by tremendous atrocities? Not worth it. This is the images. I don't want to upset you, but these are the realities. Look at the emotion the mother is. This may be the last time it sees his baby. Chicken, the same thing. Eggs come from chicken, correct? <laughs> Whoever laughs the hardest has to do it. <laughs> has to listen to this. So chickens are the same thing. Look at this. This is how chickens are kept. And this is the sad story. In 1957, average age of a chicken used to be 900. 905 to 5 grams, now 4,000 grams, almost 4 kilos. Each chicken, how? Heavy feed and hormones. Same problem. Animal industry is one of the most cruel industry. Now, this is, there is a story I need to tell you. These are the chickens which are kept in a cage. But I got this from Diet for New America, John Robbins' book. I cried reading that book. See, this is what happens. So the chickens, chicks, they keep it in a cage, first of all. Now, first two weeks, they expose them to very heavy light, very bright light, like a searchlight. Why? Because some crazy scientists figured it out that by throwing the light on them, they grow faster. Now, imagine being subjected to heavy light for two weeks. You can't sleep, right? So this is the background. This is how the chicks are grown. And then they are kept in the iron cages. And iron cages are kept, but the floor of the iron cage is slanting. Why? Because they don't have time. When they want to open the cage, they just want to grab and take it out. Because if it's a horizontal, and if it keeps on holding on to the cage, it cannot take it out that easily. Waste of time. So they would have a slanting cages. So what's gonna happen is, one, they, of course in a small cage there are hundreds and hundreds of chicken. So they are continuously rubbing against the iron, uh, the, these rods, and they have ulcers and all these infections and everything. But on top of that, because the floor is slanting, they hold on to the sides, all right? Holding on to the side of a baby chicken, and this is how they are growing. So the rod, actually becomes part of their feet. Part of their feet, the foot goes, grows around it. And what happens is when they have to take them out, what do they do? Cut the feet. 
Now, also, the next slide is a very sad story. Because they have been bombarded with this light, they are literally, they have a lot of psychological disorders. So when they are in the cages, they continuously fight with each other. And they pack each other. They don't care whether chicken pack each other or not. But they end up killing another chicken sometimes. And that's a loss. So what do they do? What do you think they would do? Well, this is the male chickens being slaughtered. This, they will cut the, cut the beak. So, no eggs anymore, please. And no milk, cheese, butter, yogurt. This is another sad story. And Buddha said the same thing, right? In three different scriptures, Mahayana, Lankaparata, and Ungulimala. Eating meat, fish, and any animal products which are the result of harming and killing of any sentient being should be prohibited. This is the truth. He spoke nothing but the truth. Next slide. Next one. So, I just want to tell you that people are looking around for so many diets. DASH diet, Mediterranean diet, South Beach diet, Keto diet, Paleo diet. But whole food plant-based diet is the only diet which not only helps you lose weight, but it teaches you compassion. Compassionate at every dinner plate. Compassion, compassion, compassion. This is where I end. I'm sorry I took a long time, but that's my passion and I did it. So, any questions, I'll take if there is any. Thank you. What do you think about the soul? Because some doctor recommends that you should have a 